Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Global Agenda at the University of Delaware. I'm Ralph Begleiter, the director of the Center for Political Communication. Global Agenda is supported by the University of Delaware's Institute for Global Studies, the Department of Political Science and International Relations, and the Department of Communication. Imagine a world that might be described by writers like H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, Aldous Huxley, and George Orwell, all combining their efforts. Powerful governments using pervasive surveillance to discover everything citizens say and watching everything they do. Creating Orwellian ministries of truth that dispense everything but the truth and shape how people see the world and how they act in it. Tracking our fingerprints and our facial dimensions and even the unique patterns revealed in our eyes. Now imagine that it's not merely governments doing all that, it's private businesses too. Companies with huge financial resources, oftentimes bigger than the resources of governments. Insurance companies who know our genetic makeup and can limit our coverage based on whether we're likely to develop cancer or autism. Companies that can collect our photos and personal contact lists and even know precisely where we are walking or driving at any moment. And not just in our country, all around the world, able to interact with us instantly every minute of the day to influence us, to dip into our bank accounts, to shape our tastes in music and movies, able to decide without consequences and even without consulting us, much less getting our approval, whether we're allowed to post our pictures on a website like Flickr or whether we can communicate using technology like Skype. Just a few years ago, this would have sounded like futuristic science fiction. Those authors I mentioned might have, derided, might have been derided as doomsayers imagining the worst. But today, many of these things are actual reality, both in the United States and elsewhere. And most of us, one way or another, actually buy into it by plugging our cell phones and tablets and computers into the electronic cloud, where all this information flows freely to and from each one of us, often without our knowing it. Our guest speaker tonight, Melissa Hathaway, is widely credited with having called attention to this science fiction world among policymakers at the highest level in the United States. She designed the first government-wide program systematically dealing with cybersecurity. She launched the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative in the White House. Uh, it, in, the, in the White House of President George W. Bush. It was then adopted and expanded after President Obama took office. The Cyberspace Policy Review became the blueprint for the United States and other nations around the world. Melissa Hathaway currently teaches and is a senior advisor at the Harvard Kennedy School Belfer Center. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree at American University in Washington in international relations and government, and studied at the Armed Forces Staff College in Norfolk, Virginia. She's been awarded two major medals for her service to the US government, the National Intelligence Reform Medal, she was only the second recipient in history to receive that award, and the National Intelligence Meritorious Unit Citation, which was a team award uh, rewarding her team for transforming government. She received that last December. Please welcome Melissa Hathaway to the University of Delaware. Thanks. It was great. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here this evening. And it's uh, my honor to be here at the University of Delaware. And uh, thank you for the spring evening as well. Uh, um, you never know this time of year up here, do you? Um, I have uh, the opportunity to walk you through a little bit of history and a little bit of um, cybersecurity from my perspective, and I'm looking forward to your questions. 
Um, many of you may not know that the internet uh, was born from a, a research and development project at the Advanced Research Projects Agency in 1969. Its first transmission and the, the cartoons around it uh, were uh, thinking that at that time that the internet could be both for good and evil. And the original cartoon has a skull and crossbones, a Batman signal in the sky, and Moby Dick, among other things. And it's really fun to look at the old cartoons of it. Um, and, uh, I, and it was developed uh, for assured communications of the military in the event of a nuclear disaster. And it was never seen as the backbone of the global economy of which we see it today. Today, the internet and the information communication technologies around it is one of the largest export industries of the United States of America. Quite amazing. And, um, and that uh, uh, proceeded along a path of, from the first transmission in 1969 in the United States to launching across the Atlantic in 1972. And uh, a few years later, we began the World Wide Web and be able to replace the old um, search uh, of the library and the periodicals to the World Wide Web and just plug in what you want to find. And eventually, through Wikipedia, it replaced the Encyclopedia Britannica. In 2002, we found it to be a social media platform. And it was the beginning of social networking and instant messaging and things along those lines. In 2003, we saw the first transmission of voice over internet protocol and video over internet protocol and the launch of a new industry with Skype and, and a new way to communicate with our family and friends all around the world and actually see their faces. That innovation continued and today we see the information services economy bloating all around the world and certainly burgeoning with now 500,000 apps that are either free or something akin to a five and dime store where you go in for candy, it's only 99 cents or $1.99, which is quite affordable for something that's going to enhance your ability to find the next location on the map or to uh, find the um, next entertainment of, of the like. <clears throat> Information communications technology is the super umbrella of all things that are communication devices. Today, that's our cellular phone. It could be our iPad, our iTouch, our i-everything. Tomorrow, that communications device could be your refrigerator or your toaster. It's the applications encompassing radio, television, cellular phones, computer, networks, hardware, software, including satellite systems, and so on. It's that easy pass as you go down the, uh, as you go down the highway. Various services and applications associated with them to include video conferencing and distance learning. And, um, and we have not even seen all of the things that the internet is going to enable in the future. And, uh, and time will tell as we, as we migrate down this path. Um, in the year 2000, the United Nations recognized the importance of this information communication technology and what it could mean to our future of world development and economic growth. And it highlighted that this technology could help generate income and employment around the world. It could provide access to business and information around the world. It could enable e-learning and bring education to every, every province and every household. And it could also facilitate government, even though the government sometimes is not the early adopter of the technology. It's driving change. I can remember the mainframe that I worked on in the early days of my uh, university, and then a mini computer, which was really actually the size of a suitcase, the IBM, which I was, and it was quite heavy, one of those, those roller bag kind of, um, and it actually was on rollers. Then we had PC um, and, uh, and the desktop internet as it emerged in the, in the later 90s, <clears throat> and now mobile internet that's on every single one of our iPads, smartphones, Kindles, MP3, et cetera. That mobile computing, coupled with high-speed broadband access, is driving new ways to do old things differently, faster, cheaper, better. 
more connected. Well, we've gone from a dial-up telephone system where you could then log in and get to your computer to now 24 by 7 access to uh, your music, to your data, to your games in the palm of your hand. We have more affordable Wi-Fi. It's nearly ubiquitous. You can find it in the library. You can find it in the Starbucks. You can find it almost anywhere. It's almost a, a a Dr. Seuss, I can find it here, I can find it there, I can find it everywhere. And then it's faster, uh, there's not as much, it's not slow, it's easy to boot up, it's easy to search, it's easy to connect to your uh, destination, and it's even easy now to pay for whatever book or online activity that you want to have. My kids will tell you that it's fun to use. You've got the casual, you've got gaming, you've got uh, social media, you've got all of these things on it, and that it's, uh, it's really their, play, their place to play, not so much to study. And then it's access to everything all the time, your music, your video, your pictures, your data, your stuff, it's all in the cloud. This cloud, where does it exist? It actually exists around the corner. It actually exists in South America. It exists in Europe, and your data is really parked everywhere around the world. But that allows you easy access to it all the time. The United Nations then continued to, to measure us as whether, as whether we're a developed society on that information communications technology on an access based on a few things that are really important, which is actually still driving our market adoption um, and whether our speed of adoption. And they're measuring our governments based on the price of your internet service and your broadband communication. Is it costly or is it inexpensive? The bandwidth. Do you have broadband to your household yet? To your business yet? Or are you still working on last generation technology? The speed of the service, which really is tied to broadband, the quality of service, not necessarily so, because the quality of service is actually tied to the regulatory environment that governs telecommunications, the plain old telephone that we used to pick up and dial, and not so much necessarily the quality of service that you may receive from your cable internet provider. They're also measuring us, the United Nations is measuring us on whether or not we're using it to develop skills. Are we promoting an e-learning environment, e-education, and promoting uh, the next generation digital workforce? Are we actually promoting, promoting an e-learning environment? Are we enabling content or blocking content? And do we support multiple languages on our internet and on that backbone? And then finally, have we made it easy to use for every citizen? And I say we, this is the United Nations, so it's 192 countries that are being measured along these lines. Are we making it easy to use for our um, our citizens. And measuring this information society is quite interesting. They rank us globally. The United States is 17th. South Korea is first. They measure us regionally against, uh, uh, and, and, and then in the effort to try to get us to adopt quicker, encourage government funding of the infrastructure, ad adoption of regulatory environment or an incentive-based environment to enable us to have this as our backbone of our lives, whether it's we're going to work, play, or live online. So the world is now increasingly at the palm of your hands, 24 by seven, it's easy to use, and you expect it as a citizen. And in some countries, like Sweden, it's now a constitutional right to have it. You have the ability to have 24 by seven, high speed internet access uh, at, at your home, at your work, and it's a citizen right. Can you imagine that being a constitutional right here? I actually can. We actually, I think, uh, un, 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 implicitly expect it. But with that comes um, its attendant risks. We have opted into this technology. We developed this technology. We have embedded this technology in every part of our life, and we've put every part of the of our United States infrastructure into that internet. And, um, and when I uh, was asked to go into the government and lead uh, some cybersecurity initiatives for President Bush and then President Obama, it wasn't so much about the innovation and, um, and where we were as far as promoting that economic growth and productivity and efficiency. 
it's what was the attendant risk that it brought with it that we may not have, uh, have looked at and thought about back when we decided we were going to move in that direction. When President Bush, when we brought him one of the first problems, um, it was about the theft of intellectual property against our core businesses here in the United States. And um, I think that it was the reality of not that it was happening, it was just with the scope, the depth and breadth of how many businesses were losing the research and the technology and their thoughts and things that were helping drive the United States economy. And he asked, what were we going to do about it? I was working then at the time for director uh, of national intelligence, Mike McConnell, who has a long history in this area as being a former director of NSA. And, um, and he was there with the president and the president turned to him and said, Mike, you brought this problem into my office and now you're gonna bring me the solution. And you know, I wanted it yesterday and he gave him about six weeks. And so um, the director then uh, turned to me and he says, Hathaway, you need to pull this together. <laughs> and I was sort of like, no pressure, sir. Um, I, uh, I will do my best. And, um, and so what we did was we took uh, um, an all of government approach because this isn't just the military's responsibility and it's not just the State Department's responsibility. There are all these different agencies that have a responsibility to address the security of our country and affect the, the innovation agenda with a, with a security conversation around it going forward. But we did take the premise that it's always easier to be on the offense than on the defense. And offensively, the United States is pretty good at this. Um, and uh, so why don't we have offense-informed defense? And, uh, and so we took a look at how um, the defense requires that good understanding of what are we gonna bring to the game? Well, we, what do we bring to the game? Well, we can bring stuff over the internet and through the internet. Those are the viruses and the, the uh, uh, malware and other things that come through the internet. It can come through, and that would normally be delivered, normally be delivered through a national security agency. Um, and, or you can bring it through an insider um, whether that is a uh, trusted person or um, a spy, or it's a actual trusted employee bringing tainted technology into the, into the environment, uh, which is called an insider, and that's normally CIA who's responsible for that. Occasionally that's the FBI too. Or through the supply chain where you're working to uh, either uh, witting or unwitting vendor to ensure that you have access into that core infrastructure. And it can be from any, almost any device that can import data or software into a system is the avenue of attack or what we're looking at offensively. And a globalized IT market, which we've worked very hard to make this a global internet communications technology market, um, our adversaries, and there are many, are exploiting our broad exposure. And because we have fully adopted and embedded all of these technologies into every part of our life, and we continue to push for that more innovation and um, technology, they're stealing, or I would say illegally copying, because you still have your data, it's on there. It's, but they've got a copy too, and it's who's first to market. So information from a target, and my target is either my Blackberry or your computer or pick the thing. They can corrupt the integrity of this information or the system, and so you no longer trust that that data is accurate. If anybody's had a corrupted file, I had one actually presenting uh, for a paper this week where my PowerPoint presentation got an infection and it decided to eat my data, and so I don't think that was deliberate, but you never know. And then, or deny the owner of the system. And many of us uh, think about that as distributed denial of service where you've basically flooded the information or flooded the system so it can't really communicate to the outside world. In the old days of the telephone system, that would be the busy signal. And, uh, and now that's really, you know, you can't get out to the internet. So what's at stake? If you're a corporation, it could be your reputation, your brand, 
your ability to grow the, the environment or grow the technology or grow your market. It could be your price point. How competitive of a price point do you have? Your market presence, your customer confidence. If you don't have access, your internet access, and you have a distributed denial of service, that could be customer confidence. Or if you're a bank and you lose your money, that could also be customer confidence. It could be your price of entry into a market. You just spent $10 billion on research and development, and it walked out the door, whether it was on a thumb drive or through the internet. Um, so price of entry could have gone up to repeat it or get to the time to market. Could be your competitiveness. Somebody else stole your plans and produced it cheaper, faster, better. Um, from a quality of service and or from an internet or from somebody, a utility, energy, uh, water, something that you're expecting to have 24 by seven could be the quality of it. For your water, it's not poisoned. Uh, quality of protection, um, you're expecting your, um, your, the currency of, uh, of the electrons coming through your wall to plug in uh, is, is going to be steady and not uh, blow up when you plug in your utility into the wall. Business continuity. And then if you're in the military or in the government, it could be actual lives um, and or the morale and uh, the existence of battlefield communications. Uh, and we're certainly seeing some of that. So I'm gonna walk you through just a couple of examples to try to make it real. Um, and uh, first is Insider, that unauthorized use or access to information systems networks by people who are either trusted employees bringing in a tainted technology or um, real spies. And uh, uh, last fall, um, the then Deputy Secretary of Defense, Bill Lynn, disclosed um, a breach that we had in the United States classified um, networks. And they were penetrated through a tainted technology that was brought in through our troops. And that tainted technology, well, I wish I had my pocketbook, was a thumb drive. So this little media device that a lot of us now use for porting data back and forth and or I know I put pictures on it and take it to um, the film store to print my pictures because I still believe in paper. Um, but at any rate, uh, this thumb drive was tainted with uh, uh, basically a back door. So when you put it into the classified system, it would then create a, a conduit for um, another country to come in and steal or try to access those systems. That was called Operation Buckshot Yankee. And I have to tell you, it was a life event for all of us in the government because we didn't have the ability to detect it because we were never looking for the inside going out. We were only looking for the outside going in. And we spent thousands and thousands of hours just, just to see how big or wide that breach was, if we had lost any data, and what we were gonna do about it. And, um, and that caused a number of policy and then technology changes within the military and the Department of Defense. And ultimately, it affected our ability to um, do some operations overseas because we uh, weren't able to move data between and among our soldiers. And one of the things you may have heard most um, and hear a lot about is uh, WikiLeaks. Well, WikiLeaks was actually conducted by a trusted person, insider, who followed some of the rules and then broke the rules. And it was interesting. So Bradley Manning actually used a DVD to transit the data. So he, got, he wrote a letter, get permission, to take the DVD and listen to music while he's sitting overnight and garden the data. Um, and he got permission to bring the DVD in. It was just never supposed to have a writable DVD and take it out with all of the data. And so um, it was actually classic of a real insider, a trusted employee, you actually broke the rules. And that resulted in a, a transmission and a lot of, a big leak of classified material, restricted access material, 250,000 diplomatic cables, and, uh, and actually quite embarrassing for the United States government. On a corporate level, um, there was a disgruntled employee of a major um, defense manufacturer who actually was charged with the theft of stealing 320,000 uh, sensitive company files over the course of two years. It came out on a thumb drive, and uh, the stolen documents if, uh, were given to competitors, and it cost the company between $5 billion and $15 billion in lost revenue. That's real money. So the insider threat 
if you were to go to popular culture, was foreshadowed in a movie by Sandra Bullock called The Net. I hope some of you have seen it. I date myself with some of these movies. At any rate, Sandra worked for a uh, commercial software company and was working on a game. And the game uh, was on a DVD. And when you plugged in that DVD, it actually gave access, a backdoor, into that information system. And all she had to do was type the password and it allowed access, and so therefore you can pull all the data out. And so I encourage you to think about what are the things that you're putting in the devices into your computers and enterprises, and what might it be pulling out, and what you might not know if you're not looking for what's going from the inside out, because we're mostly looking at from the outside in. The second was proximity access. So proximity is uh, anywhere in here, you may have a device, uh, your BlackBerry, a computer, whatever, and it's most likely Wi-Fi enabled. And, um, and uh, if I have the appropriate device, I could probably steal everything off of it in another a minute or two. Why would I want to do that? Well, some of you, I might want your contacts lists uh, because I, um, I want to uh, have access to your social network. Um, some of you might have your password stored on it. Increasingly, you have your banking data on it or credit card or other things, and so I want to steal that data. And uh, for many of those devices, they um, are not protected uh, because we haven't designed them as such. And uh, I'll give you uh, just two examples of proximity. Uh, uh, one is uh, the TJ Maxx and Marshalls. Um, when we were first uh, employing Wi-Fi networks about a decade ago, they had it in their, um, in their, home, in their store. And at the end of the day, they were going to transmit all of the transactions to the bank. But they were doing it unencrypted, so clear, clear text. And in the, in the parking lot was criminals who were, had the right device, and they intercepted it. And um, it was a bad day for TJ Maxx. Uh, and Marshalls. It cost them uh, more than a billion dollars to uh, replace all the credit cards, a free shopping day for all of those people who had lost their credit cards, and uh, several class action suits. It was one of the largest customer uh, data breaches for uh, 96 million credit cards. But what it did also was let a backdoor into the overall payment system. So some of you have received a um, email or read in the newspaper that the most recent payment card industry had all of their, was hacked into and they had a big breach and millions of Visa cards and Amex, et cetera, have been stolen. This industry is highly regulated, but they're regulated toward a compliance checklist. Um, it's called payment card industry uh, regulation and it's a, it's a checklist. So I have to know, did I keep all my systems or are my systems secure today on the audit day? Check. Now tomorrow I might have a new vulnerability in my system, but it doesn't matter. I'm, I was compliant yesterday, so therefore, and I met my regulation, um, and so I don't have to worry about continuously monitoring to see if tomorrow I've got a problem. And that's part of the problem is compliance doesn't mean security. And, um, and so the proximity led to and continues to lead to a number of breaches of us losing our credit cards, which I have to tell you, and I don't know for many of you if this has been a problem for you, but um, I have a couple credit cards that are tied to just about everything. The newspaper, the milkman, the kids' school lunches. And when um, I get a new credit card, I'm like, you got to be kidding me, because then I got to call the school and replace it. I've got to call the newspaper with a new credit card. And occasionally, it's tied to something that I didn't even know. And it gets shut down. And I'm like, OK, well, why didn't I get that? And Because I, I didn't get the phone call. And it was, was because that credit card was tied to that. And that's such a problem. Um, another thing of proximity that we haven't really, um, we haven't embraced yet, and uh, it's alive and well in other countries, um, uh, and many of you, you might have it in your car, but OnStar Surveillance for GMC has the ability to collect your GPS location information and your speed for any purpose at any time. And I know that many of you must have EasyPass, and I know I have EasyPass. And if we were to want to, we could actually use EasyPass as that proximity to your car and log you and see if you're going 65 miles an hour on 95 or 75 miles an hour on 95 or faster on 95 and log you from toll booth to toll booth. And in other countries, you automatically get a ticket. 
And, uh, and so I can imagine something like that could be put in place here as well. Um, and so proximity, you're within proximity of being found. It's a, whether you're not, your proximity of being caught. And, um, and so something to think about. Uh, and, um, and if you were to think about the uh, proximity access and those who are trying to steal our credit cards, I have another example of a movie, which you may or may not have seen, and it involved John Travolta. And it was called Swordfish. And John Travolta was the bad guy, and he was an organized crime. And um, he hired the best hacker ever who knew how to get into and crack the code on breaking into systems that were highly secure, our banks. And, um, and so Swordfish was all about hiring the hackers to steal back money that the government had either seized or steal back more money unbeknownst to the government. And the organized crime rings are alive and well in stealing our credit cards and stealing our passwords and getting to our banks. And it's one of the best kept secrets that we all should be witting of. So why should we care? Well, um, for those of you who uh, five years ago might have had a 9% uh, average percentage rate on your credit card, it might be as much as 19% on your average percentage rate. So what does that mean? Or let's just round it up to 20. Let's carry, I'm carrying a $100 balance on my credit card from month to month. Now next month it might be $120 and the month after that and so on. And you keep on adding the money. Well, why is that? It went from 9% to 19% because the banks have to recover the cost of all the money that they're losing to the organized crime. Coming over the internet. It's accessing your computer, my system, over the network through technical means. And usually it's over the internet. And, um, and so I'm just gonna give you a couple of uh, things for food for thought. Um, this is where computer hackers are breaching Citigroup, Epsilon, you name it. There were the most significant uh, breaches last year, Sony PlayStation. Um, last week in Utah, it was Medicare and Medicaid. And they're coming over the internet and tricking us to click on a link and so that they can get our passwords, get our social security numbers, assume our identity, and, um, and, then, and then benefit from that. And um, uh, one of the things that I don't think that we think about very often is how easy it is and how young this industry is. So in 1988, we had the first real worm, and it was called the Morris worm and it infected nearly 90% of the world's computers. It resulted in Carnegie Mellon having the first computer software security institute and funded through the Department of Defense. And Carnegie Mellon has an amazing program now in computer security and still one of the trusted repositories for the United States government. Digital Equipment Corporation created the first firewall, an intrusion detection system, an intrusion prevention system. It was the launch of the antivirus software market, 1990, not that long ago. And, um, and all of that was really because you're coming over the internet. <clears throat> and, uh, and then uh, there are certain things that we're downloading these days that we don't even think twice about. You have that 500,000 apps, some are free and some are not. Um, uh, and we don't think about whether or not they've been vetted or what other things might be behind them. And uh, so when I'm teaching at uh, university, I talk about uh, Angry Birds and, you know, and that it's a viral game. Everybody loves to play it, and it gets downloaded often. And nobody knows if that's a backdoor into your system. Um, I could imagine a clever criminal actually designing a, an application that would go viral on the internet so everybody would want to download it so that just to get access to your computer to harvest your passwords and exfiltrate for the next thing. Um, there was a very significant breach that happened uh, recently, last March, um, and it was something that we used for ensuring that when we went on the internet and we conducted our transaction or we went to our, comp our companies or we went to our banks, that we're using a second form of identification. And so right now we normally use our login, our name, and some password, whatever we created. 
But for certain transactions, like to go to your company into the private network or to go to a bank, you need another form of authentication. Um, and uh, usually this is a eight digit code that's on a key fob. And I'm talking about a token. This one I'm talking about RSA. And so many of you might have this and it changes, the number changes every 30 seconds or every 60 seconds. Um, my husband has it for his firm and, and actually most banks have it and most companies have some second form of authentication. Well, what is that? It's actually the key, the second key, and it's really the key to the house. And if that's stolen, um, then I don't need your name or password really. I can actually, because I can figure that out pretty quickly. I have the key to the house. I can go in and I can take whatever I need. And so that second factor authentication now is, uh, is, is now challenging our thought of what is security on the internet in a secure transaction when we need that second form of authentication. Now, um, there are some fixes to that. In Bulgaria, they're pretty clever because they're dealing with a lot of organized crime there. And what they've done, if we go to an ATM machine and you no longer just need your card and your PIN, but you also have to have your cell phone on and it'll geolocate you to that, in fact, terminal so they know it's you because it's your phone with the card, with the PIN. Because I can pretty easily steal the card and the PIN, but I can't really easily steal your phone yet and all of that or geolocate you to the specific terminal. So that's one way around in getting to a second form of authentication. There's a, a great movie. Uh, that talked about the importance of that authentication and the cryptography around it, and it was called Sneakers with Robert Redford and Ben Kingsley and Dan Aykroyd, and it was a great movie. And Ben Kingsley was the bad guy, and he had the magic key to the kingdom that could read and see anything if he stole it. And, um, and Robert Redford and Dan Aykroyd and a number of the other uh, actors were there to go steal the key because we need to have the key because we need to read everything and see everything and be able to steal everything. And, um, and, uh, and that's where we're at. Our people are stealing the keys so they can read everything, see everything, steal anything. And we don't have a second set of keys that we can replace or rekey the house yet unless if we start to go for new innovative ideas. The last is the supply chain. And that's you know, gaining advantage or control, access to systems through the manipulation of the vendor and whatever product they're selling. And we normally think about this as hardware, but it could be software as well. Um, and I'm gonna use a couple of examples again where uh, for those, um, and these are all true. Um, McDonald's and most grocery stores and other places around, we have these point of sale terminals. When we go to the grocery store or we're on an airplane and we're paying for the food, um, that little thing that you swipe your card and you press your pin number in is called a point of sale terminal. Well, that's sort of like the linchpin of your credit card or your ATM card and your pin, that second form to tell you who it is, and the bank. And organized crime and others have figured out that, wow, all I have to do is manipulate that one thing and I get it all, I get to collect it. And so those point of sale terminals have been manipulated around the world where they have collect your data and it goes to the bank. So the transaction goes through and supermarket gets paid or McDonald's allows you to buy your fries and Coke. Uh, but it also goes dual path to organized crime headquarters and then they print another card and they got your pin and they can start using transactions on it. And, uh, and it's uh, widely uh, being used, and uh, most recently or recently, uh, that skimming uh, affected 3,500 customers in Australia and cost the McDonald's about four and a half million dollars. And if you're thinking about uh, McDonald's as a franchise, that could affect a small business owner. Um, may not big, big McDonald's, but yeah, for the small business, you know, four and a half million dollars could put you out of business. Second, on another manipulation of the supply chain was um, Dell, Dell Computers, confirmed that it had some of its motherboards, which is like the guts of the computer, were shipped to customers with a malware embedded in it at the server or the firmware. Well, what does that mean? It was a key logger. And so it actually would transmit your password in real time to whoever had actually embedded that. 
So it's actually tracking your key, your logging of your, of your password. And it was really remarkable. So how do you defeat these kind of, uh, of operations that are done by the spies and the sneaky guys? And it's very difficult to manage that risk as you're going forward. But most, um, and one last one that I think is really important is um, uh, one of the recent manipulations of the supply chain was um, the uh, Stuxnet. So Stuxnet was a weapon that was used for, uh, against the Iran nuclear power plant. And it used actually a combination of somebody with a thumb drive to get control of the Siemens control, um, uh, basically keys to their software. It used a virus to embed all around, all around the world to communicate, you know, I'm here, this is the infrastructure I'm sitting on. And it uh, had a significant effect, as you know, on the overall critical infrastructure. And a movie that perhaps could have foreshadowed it was Bruce Willis, Live Free, Die Hard, and foreshadowed that those control systems are vulnerable to being manipulated and can take down a core infrastructure. And there's lots of conversations now about our energy grid, the power grid, and other things, our water supply, and other things that could be, in fact, manipulated um, and or destroyed at the infrastructure level. And do we have a fallback plan for the resilience? And, um, and I ask that as an open-ended question. Um, so we've opted in to a lot of this technology for fun, uh, because we needed to, um, uh, to access information, uh, to uh, miniaturize uh, our data and everything. And we've seen a convergence of two forces, productivity, efficiency, innovation, modernization on one side, and uh, a national security conversation that's emerging of what about my critical infrastructure? What about my protecting my intellectual property? What about the defense of my homeland? And in some cases, what about my regime stability? And, um, and so we're not necessarily having the conversation of both at the same time. We hear a conversation about we need to create more efficiency and growth of our economy, and we're going to move things to a smart grid, which is an internet-based infrastructure. We're going to manage most of our things from the internet or from the cloud, and we're moving more and more into this world of the internet and dependency on the internet. And then sometimes we're having a conversation about, oh my God, I just lost $5 billion to $15 billion worth of intellectual property. That's a big deal to a company. And what am I going to do about intellectual property protection? And what are you going to do to prevent me from being stolen blind from my organized crime group? And, um, and we need to have a conversation of how can we have both? How can we work together for both? And um, I'm going to use uh, two examples that I hope um, will make you think uh, about this a little bit more. And um, the first is resiliency in that infrastructure. And about a year ago, year ago holiday season, I was shopping for Legos on Christmas Eve with my son, Alexander. And he was 11. And uh, there's a very long line. And I don't normally, I'm never, I'm never at the mall on Christmas Eve. Uh, and so I didn't really know what to expect. And there's about 20 some odd people online, but I've got my thing and it's Alexander's present for his younger brother and it's all good. But the store manager comes up and he says, ma'am, it's gonna be a while. And I was like, well, I can see it. There's 20 people ahead of me. I can see it's gonna be a while. You know, um, it's gonna be a while because the server is down. Okay. so. It's a cloud-based operation storing into a uh, server somewhere, and that server was in Pennsylvania, and it was down. And I said, well, how long has it been down? He says, four hours. And I said, oh, okay. Alexander, pack up. We're not saying. And, and, um, and he says, well, why, Mommy? <clears throat> Don't you have cash? <laughs> and I said, yes, of course I have cash. I probably even have it down to the penny. He says, so what's the problem, mommy? Let's just pay cash and go. And I said, well, because the computer can't take inventory and they can't account for the transaction and it's not working. And, um, 
And he said, well, can't they write it down? And I said, well, this doesn't work that way. And he says, well, mommy, we're not a very advanced society if we can't go backwards. <laughs> so that's right, Alexander, we're, we're going now. So, um, and, uh, and I'd like to just call attention as we're putting more and more stuff into the cloud. Um, I don't think that we're necessarily thinking about the resiliency, the backup, and what that means to our, just our way of life. And I'm gonna call out the two examples, or one example. And one, I think, and there's sort of both seminal events. So uh, many people use Google, and uh, many of you may know that on the 1st of March, <clears throat> Google decided to merge all of their platforms. Um, and so your Google Mail with uh, your Google searches and your whole Google profile kind of merge in a convergence of everything about you online. And, um, and it was part of that, uh, the portrait that it can paint of you, uh, I think that not many people really realize. And why do I call this out? Well. Um, you have opted in to giving away your privacy. And, um, and not many people realize that. So let's just say, how, what does that mean, Melissa? I don't understand. OK, so you're on Gmail, which you've given, been given as a free service. And somewhere in that agreement says that they're going to monitor you. I would call it surveillance, but monitor you for what you're doing. And they're going to sell that data. So my mom will send me an email, and she says, Melissa, I'm thinking about getting you, you know, this book for Christmas, and have you tested this recipe? And then lo and behold, a few minutes later, you might get, if you like this book, you'll like this book, this book, and this book. Or if you've tested this chocolate chip recipe, you might like to try this recipe and this recipe. And you're like, well, how do they know that? Well, because they're data mining your data, and because you got something for free, but there really was a cost to it. And, um, and I have to tell you, I don't, use, um, I don't use Gmail very often, and they gave us an opportunity on 1 March to potentially opt out of some of these features, but they've made it very difficult to opt out of some of those features, and I consider myself a pretty computer literate person. Um, the second is uh, maybe a little bit more um, in insidious because um, we have so many of our uh, kids, teenagers, and others working off of Facebook. Facebook is really this alternate reality, if you ask me, on um, you know, uh, uh, this other life. You know, I don't need to meet you in the cafe anymore for coffee because we can meet online. And I don't need to think about you know, going to the farm because I got a farm bill. And I don't need to think about money because I have some fake money that I get to use on Facebook. And there are other alternative uh, reality things like Second Life and, um, and Minecraft and others. And uh, so I just want to highlight that um, if you have not thought about your privacy on this, uh, then you need to think about it. Because when you sign up, it automatically makes everything in the public and in the clear. And for those of you who are parents, I'd like to just call out one most disturbing app that was called to my attention just a few days ago. And it's called Girls Around Me. And it takes advantage of those public profiles and the Foursquare uh, feature within it. And if you sit in a public face and there's a female out there using and has her Facebook feature on time, it will geolocate you and tell you everything about her as she walks by or she's in the vicinity. And so it's an avenue where I grew up with, you don't talk to strangers and you don't allow people into your private life. We don't have the same digital uh, learning happening and awareness happening of I'm not sure that the women or men, and as they have that feature enabled, actually know that they could be stalked. In the United Kingdom, they've invented a game to make it viral, to bring that awareness about those teenagers, and it's called Smokescreen. And it gives you 14 different scenarios that you get through of how people find you through that public data, how you might get yourself in trouble through publicly posting, like, I'm going to have a party on Friday night, and instead of the 10 friends that you thought were coming, you have 200 friends come. 
and other scenarios that are very likely. And it makes you wonder of whether we're talking about the government or industry, are you a spy? Was that a lie? Or are they just sneaky guys? And so with that, thank you, and I'd like to take your questions. Thank you, Melissa. I was actually going to follow up with a question about governments and the interaction with private industry. <laughs> Many of the examples you used tonight were examples of private individuals or private companies, technology, building into their hardware, building into their software, some kind of a, an avenue into your data and my data. My question is, uh, in the United States, is it the case that those avenues into our data from hypothetically angry birds or any of the other examples you gave, are those shared with the government? And does the government have the opportunity or the ability to take advantage of gathering that data or purchasing that data from the private corporations that are collecting them? Well, the, the data is definitely for sale. The, um, the private sector can't actually collect data on the request or behalf of the government unless if there's a warrant or a legal mechanism by which to do it. Otherwise, they're considered as an agent of the state, which is not allowed in the United States. However, if the data is for sale, um, I can imagine areas where it, it could be purchased um, to, to gather the, the information. So would it be naive of me to suggest that if the US government wanted the information, it could simply buy it from Google? Um, I think that there is a lot of information that is procurable. Uh, whether or not Google is selling it, I don't know. And now let me ask the same question vis-a-vis -vis other countries. A company like Foxconn in China, which builds a lot of the technology for American uh, uh, cyber equipment, including Apple's products, but other companies as well. Does that company cooperate with the Chinese government? And is it possible that back doors are being built into our technology through which our data is flowing in effect directly to the Chinese government? So there's lots of fear that um, the supply chain has got, um, all aspects of the supply chain can be manipulated, whether it's from just the design stage, uh, um, and, you know, whether it's a field programmable gate array, which is your semiconductor chip, um, whether or not that gets designed so it has a back door to the actual core infrastructure. Um, there are many governments around the world that can, in fact, work cooperatively with their industry because they don't necessarily have a bright line of uh, difference between uh, industry and government um, and what's in the benefit of the state. And, um, and so there is much fear about uh, who can do what. And I got to tell you, most countries are afraid that we're doing it to them. And so um, I think the thing that I worry about most when we talk about the supply chain is it is a global supply chain, and we're there. And undoing it is, is not going to be uh, something that is uh, cost effective. So as we're moving for efficiency, productivity, and price point, and speed of use, and 24 by 7, bring your own device to wherever you're going to be, uh, you have to think about how do you manage the risk along multiple levels corporate responsibility and national responsibility, and, um, and it needs to be a collective international responsibility. And are we, as a country, gathering data on other countries through the companies in those countries that manufacture the products we ask them to manufacture? Are we gathering? The United States government collects on, um, mostly collects on what other governments are doing, not what other industries are doing. And so uh, we usually rely on industry to tell us what their competitors are doing. Um, we, as if I was still in the government. You mentioned uh, at the end of your remarks the problem of not having a fallback plan for resiliency on infrastructure. I just want to make that a little more vivid, if I may. Would it be possible for someone who, for whatever reason, had it in their head to do this, to shut down our electric grid, to close down our air traffic control, to inhibit the flow of oil or natural gas through our pipelines in the United States, to 
do any of the above or any combination of other things I haven't just mentioned just now simply by doing to us what several countries did to Iran with its nuclear uh, computer system? Uh, with the uh, right amount of money or expertise, which is viable on the internet, um, and creativity, it's our, infrastructure, our critical infrastructure is vulnerable to attack. The uh, <clears throat> weapons that we're seeing developed and or used um, are proliferating widely. Uh, the Stuxnet, I would call it a weapon, has already been replicated a couple of times over. And um, you can't determine who will use it. I think it's a question of when it will be used or something like that to take down the, a, a critical infrastructure. And yes, the United States is vulnerable. Okay. I got to ask you this. This is a silly question, but what would my toaster have to say to the internet? I mean, who would want to know what my toaster is doing? You laugh. I, you know, I, I don't, I should have done the research. I, um, so everything is going to have an internet protocol address uh, and uh, assigned to it in the future. And we're getting into that. Um, and so why would it have, a, why would you care? Well, as we're moving into the smart grid house of the future, you could um, have left the toaster plugged in and perhaps it's using a micro piece of energy um, just to keep the plug hot and or your refrigerator or your heating. And you're going to be able to control your smart grid house from wherever you are over the internet. And, um, and so you can turn on the oven to make sure it's hot when you come home. Um, you can turn up the heat, uh, you know, as you're sitting in traffic and, and all of these things, on and off the lights, and you can monitor it. It's, in, it's supposed to help you encourage to use less energy because you can check on it during the day and, all, and can see your consumption rates and control your life in a better way. Um, and so your toaster and everything in the future will have an IP address. Um, and I worry about that because uh, it gives a whole new meaning of being in the room with a computer and I could be in the neighborhood and drive down and I could search into your house through the, my computer because I know how to use it, turn on your lights or turn off your lights or turn up your heat or uh, break in if I needed to. And, um, uh, and so I worry about that. And so, um, and what I worry about probably even more is let's just say somebody really wants to do harm. Um, uh, our power grid is, and the power companies are very used to dealing with um, the power, uh, like everybody getting up in the morning rush hour, and Super Bowl Sunday. All the TVs are on and everything, so the, the whole kind of the super power consumption. Uh, but what they're not used to is having everything turn off, because the energy is a flow system, put and take, 10% variable, and so if everything turns off, it's all gotta go somewhere. And, um, and so as we move to smart grid, we haven't necessarily designed enough of the smart system around it to regulate the puts and takes to enable, and if somebody wanted to do something nefarious, it would be a problem. We, uh, as you, you mentioned in your remarks, that uh, the Second Life, one of the virtual worlds, we, we uh, webcast these programs on Second Life, and we actually have a question from uh, someone in your neck of the woods, Northern Virginia, just outside the Washington area. My guess is maybe somebody who knows that you're gonna be here tonight or whatever. <laughs> you talked about credit cards and credit card companies and you talked about the point of sale devices mm -hmm. and the theft and so on. Our second life questioner is pointing out that the big players in the credit card industry have gotten together to develop their own security system and the questioner is asking whether you think it would be beneficial for the government to step in and regulate that, or whether you think it's okay for the industry to get together and figure out how to prevent the kind of theft that you were talking about earlier? Well, I, um, I have mixed views on regulation, so I'm going to presume that our Second Life person may be talking about chip and pin, um, which is basically an added security mechanism built into the credit card, um, and that is uh, shown just some improvement overseas um, so some of you may, if you, your credit card doesn't necessarily work overseas in certain uh, areas and vice versa. Their credit cards don't work in our point of sale terminals. So we've lost some interoperability for that security because not everybody around the world has opted into that technology. But what you'll find from some of the credit card industry abroad 
is then that made the bank a higher value target um, and or this, uh, the clearing houses. So instead of going after the terminal for each thing that I could, I could swap at the, at the grocery store or at the McDonald's, then I pulled it back in and I went now after the, the, uh, the payment card clearing house like what we saw here in the United States just last week um, or, um, or the banks themselves. Okay. Let's turn to your questions now. We alternate between student questions and non-student questions. Let's go for a student question first. You're a student. Go for it. Speak up, please. You mentioned about the PS3 hack. Well, as a PS3 network user, I'm wondering what kind of hack that was and could they steal my credit card information when I set up my account and all that? Because I know the hack is like, like 20 something year old guys who got mad at PSN and hacked that way. Okay, you're going to have to explain what PSNet is. <laughs> To the rest of us, the question is about what was the PS net hack, and is it true that 20-somethings, this young man is very skeptical of people in their 20s, you know, you can't, you can't trust anybody over 20. Well, you look like you're my son's age, so let me start with, um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your question in just a minute, but uh, so my, my boys are 11 and 12, and, uh, and this is relevant because uh, one of our next-door neighbors, the 12-year-old, uh, took advantage of my other next door neighbor having an, a, a Wi-Fi network that wasn't password protected. And he thought that she should know that. And so he went in and used her network because it's open to the public and put a password on it. And, um, and, uh, and so uh, 11 and 12 year olds are quite good at the internet, maybe better than the 20 somethings. Um, PlayStation, a Sony PlayStation, uh, so PS stands for PlayStation. PlayStation. Got it. Sony PlayStation, the PlayStation Network, online multiplayer. Uh, uh, some of you have just that at home uh, uh, player. Uh, uh, I'm not a Sony PlayStation. We are we family, but uh, but still, it's all kind of in the same kind of ballpark. Um, so the Sony PlayStation hack uh, it went after our children and their data. And what's valuable about your data? Your account information. Well, your account information is important because not only it's your name and whatever set of passwords that you use, uh, it's tied to your, your mom, dad's credit card. Um, and occasionally, uh, not necessarily Sony, but it, it ties to your social security number. Well, um, your social security number is not paired with a credit rating or somebody stealing your social security number until you're 18. And so they can recreate you as a persona using your social security number and get credit cards and actually bankrupt you before you get to college. And, um, and that's happening. And so the significance of the Sony PlayStation to me was that it targeted the kids and a particular population because their data isn't necessarily um, looked at the same way that adult data is with the checks and balances for theft and fraud. Is the technology in areas like gaming and the downloadable apps you mentioned earlier proceeding at a pace so fast that we can't even begin to keep up in terms of defenses? And I'm not even speaking about government defenses at the moment. I'm speaking about individual or family defenses. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was thinking about this on the way up. Uh, how do you, we have now a new household cost, all of us, you know, it's our, antivirus software, it's this thing I gotta worry about, you know, protecting my data, you know, backing up my data, all of these things because of our, our digital um, life is, is not the, it doesn't, it has new costs that our analog life didn't have. And, um, and so it'll be very difficult to keep up, uh, especially as the, the next thing that we adopt, the next widget, which we'll have in three months or two days, and the really next cool app that somebody wants to download or the game, um, and uh, we don't know what's in it. And so what I think is that instead of every household, I mean, certainly we all have a responsibility to be good digital citizens, but we don't, and, and, and by definition that means that we're sort of a front line of defense, but we shouldn't be the only line of defense. And some of you have, um, uh, your internet service providers have, um, are providing you with a service of more security. 
um, and that's helping you remove the viruses and make sure the viruses don't get to your computer. It's telling you if you have an infection on your computer um, and uh, it's providing you with a service to help you ensure that you have a clean internet experience. And, um, and many of them, of, uh, like Cox Cable and others, have opted into doing this as a service to you. I think that that managed security service that we should ask them, our cable providers, our internet providers, to give us with a clean experience on the internet, at least do as much as they can. And I think that they can do more. And um, as citizens have a demand curve for that because you really don't want to be going to the Best Buy or pick your place to get the latest and greatest antivirus and the greatest technology to protect me from X and another one for Y and another one for Z. Can't we make it so that the bitstream of the ones and zeros that are going to your computer and et cetera, that those who are the pipes and the delivery mechanism can actually help provide you a more secure service? Let's take a question from a non-student. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned email and uh, the salary thing commercially. Other providers, if you want to be, would they be less likely? The question is about Gmail. You mentioned that uh, Google sells the data from, that it collects from your account on Gmail. The question is uh, whether there are other providers who would be better uh, for us as consumers than, than Google's free Gmail if you pay a fee for your email service? Um, it, uh, it really depends on the service level, the agreement that you sign. So there, uh, I look at it as there's, there's no such thing as free lunch. So if you're getting it for free, then there's some benefit somewhere that you just haven't read about or realized. Um, if you're paying a fee for it, then there's um, usually some boundaries of what is allowed and not allowed and permitted. Uh, unfortunately, that right now that means you have to read through usually scrolls and scrolls and scrolls of the agreement, and it's in really fine print. Um, and uh, then you have to choose whether you're going to opt in or you opt out. And uh, because there really is, uh, there's no in between, right? You're not negotiating that agreement. You're either going to sign up to it or you're not going to sign up to it. And, uh, but I encourage everybody to be winning of what they're signing up for, um, because many of you don't know. In that connection, you mentioned something earlier in, our, in your conversation with my students that I'd like to bring out here, and trust me, this is worthwhile. Uh, <laughs> university of Delaware students receive free email accounts while they're here at the university. They're Gmail accounts provided by Google. Uh, you, you describe to our students what happens under the agreement between a university, this one and many others as well, that use the same system, and, the, and, and Google that provides that service for free. Talk about that a little bit in light of your comment about there's no free lunch. So um, at, least at, at least another university, uh, many universities are opting in. It's a very clever marketing um, and uh, I, it's a great business model if you agree with the business model. And um, per the agreement, and I don't know what the University of Delaware's agreement is, is that uh, the infrastructure and everything is provided uh, to the university. The infrastructure for, G for, for mail, email, Gmail, for the students. For the students. And upon graduation and or leaving the university, all of the data and all of the activity that they had during the time of the university experience will then be up for sale or be able to be used. Now that's no different than if you were to do Gmail right now as a personal individual, because right, you opt in, you, it's for sale. Um, but uh, I uh, think about that as everybody, most people think that they have um, an expectation of privacy of their data and their actions online. And, um, and that would be our Fourth Amendment rights of privacy and uh, not uh, uh, subject to unreasonable search and seizure. Now that applies to the government. Shouldn't it also apply? Are we really going to opt in to unreasonable search and seizure of our data, our transactions, and our personal lives from a private company? And isn't that sort of a um, oxymoron? Um, and if you're a university student required to have an email account under the university system, do you really have an option of opting out? Uh, 
you, I, I would think um, there should be at minimum a disclosure statement by the university that would say that um, informing the students that this is what's going to happen. And for many state schools, I think that it would be important that if that student were to choose to opt out of that, that there would be some secondary option that would give them some other attendant benefits or the same provision of service. Okay, question from a student. Question from a student? Yes, sir. Yeah, what is senior communications nature about to enter the job atmosphere? And of course, a lot of students are really interested in private information and the employee agencies finding out stuff on Facebook, stuff on Twitter. And they have the ability to find out what goes on in the student's private My question, on the contrary, is that is there a way for students to turn the tides and look into employees and maybe find out private information about them in order to get a foot up on, say, a job application? <laughs> okay, student uh, who's getting ready to graduate and is starting to look for jobs, knowing that employers can search his Facebook account and his email data and so on and so forth, is asking whether it's possible for students to turn the tables and investigate the companies that they are looking at for employee, employment and find out the dirt on those companies using the same techniques. Oh, you know, the internet is a great place to find data. And um, so uh, I don't subscribe to it to tit for tat, but yes, I mean, uh, you know, if you're going to go interview with a publicly held company, go pull their SEC filing. What did they report as risks? What did they lose? How many lawsuits do they have? How are they settling them? What do they see as their competitors? What are they worried about? All of that has to be publicly disclosed. If they're not public, um, you know, private companies still have news being reported on them. Go see what's on their website. Uh, do your own set of market analysis, and you can go into an interview very well armed, and um, do your research. Uh, not many, not many people do enough research on the employer and and do like the SEC and other things to do that research on what people are being paid. All of that is online. More broadly, do citizens as individuals have the ability to get into and read and observe the kind of analytical data that many companies that provide internet service are collecting on us? Can we somehow get into Google Analytics and, and see what they know about us? Um. Don't mean to be picking on Google particularly. Yeah, no, no, I, there I, are lots of other companies. I, I think that, um, you know, uh, I like to use Comscore. Comscore does the ratings for what are we watching on TV and, um, and uh, you know, the movies and things like that. Uh, you can go to Comscore and see how uh, and what kind of data they're interested in, and then they can they sell that. Um, and so you, you can start to see sort of how we're being, um, our behavior is being monitored. But it's general, and we can't find out about ourselves, I, uh, what they know about us, what they know about me. Um, uh, there are, there, I don't know if you can go directly to the company to find out exactly what they know about you. You probably could figure out a way to do that. Um, but there are tools that you could do to figure out what kind of profile could be made about you um, and, uh, and do your own internet search on yourself and find out what's easily retrievable. Okay, question from a non-student. Yes, sir. Okay, what are the top two or three things you've told your, your children to try to protect them from the threats that you mentioned tonight? Um, you'll, you'll sort of laugh, but um, uh, my, one of my sons uh, was just dying to have Minecraft, which is this uh, very addictive uh, alternate reality game that's about survival. So I kind of think of it as like Hunger Games, if anybody's seen the movie yet or read the book. And, um, and creativity or innovation. And uh, this company uh, started overseas and uh, not a lot of information about it. It's not an app, uh, at least up until November, it wasn't an app available uh, like on an app store, so which has some type of vetting. It was something that went to market in four days and uh, this, the, I'm sure the developer is a billionaire by now uh, because of that. 
So uh, I did my own research, but I asked my son to um, uh, basically build the advocacy of what research he's done on it, um, what he thought the security, you know, if there was any security, because, you know, I'm his mom, and, uh, you know, what he intended to use for it and everything. And I was very impressed because he said, you know, it's a one-time fee, they're using PayPal for the credit card, right, so there has to have some vetting there. He then went on to say that the app is being vetted right now for Android and for one of the other um, PC stores, or Mac family, but PC stores. So it has to be going through this vetting. And, um, and, and, and it was a whole argument. I was so impressed with all the research. You know, the, the developer came from this country and, you know, and like all of the, and I thought that was great. Um, and eventually we got him Minecraft. Um, and uh, uh, if, it, if, it, if it had been on an app store, I pro and it, pro it would have been less of a, like a, a dilemma for me personally, because uh, I'm, I'm really paranoid. And uh, um, other things uh, that we have instilled in them um, for, one of uh, uh, my son also decided to take and create a, a sort of a Google profile um, and didn't recognize all of the, the opt-out tickets. And, um, and so it was public-facing. And I do a Google search on my kids pretty regularly uh, because I want to know what's out there about them and, you know, and, and what, you know, what I could collect. And, um, and so I had a conversation with him, and I said, you know, did you set this up? Because he wasn't supposed to. And, uh, and, and I said, you're not in trouble. And I said, but we need to opt out of public facing. It's okay if your friends see you, but not for the rest of the world to see you. And, um, and some of those features. And so and that was really good, because uh, that was like a, before he went to bed, and he was really nervous, like, like I was really going to be upset. And by eight o'clock the next morning, it was no longer public facing. And, um, and I haven't had anything that I've found on him recently. So um, the kids are, my kids are pretty attuned to it. Um, and when our next door neighbor actually went into the public Wi-Fi or of my next door neighbor and changed the password, they um, you know, kind of said that wasn't right. That was sort of like breaking into her house. And so making the analog equivalent and I think that we really need to have a digital education system that actually brings that, the thought of right and wrong uh, into this digital environment that we're all living on. And I don't think that that's necessarily being taught. Speaking of the games reminds me of something you mentioned in your remarks that is worth following up on. You talked about Angry Birds as being an application, a game that many, many, many people have on their mobile units and they use it a lot. You're not worried on Angry Birds, about, angry, about the company that makes Angry Birds collecting you know, uh, a profile about you, you're worried about something different. And not necessarily with Angry Birds, but with games like Angry Birds. What is it that you're worried about there? OK, yeah, that's a good question. I'm not, I, so I use examples that people know well. I'm not saying that this is bad and this is bad, although. Um, uh, so an app that uh, I could imagine a very clever spy or sneaky guy that uh, would create an application that is designed to be entertaining you all the time, like a Minecraft even. And it's designed to be a fantastic game, but it's also designed to be a backdoor into your system to, for the whole time that you're online playing that, that it's a whole open door window into your whole system um, to, to take your passwords or take your intellectual property, it depends on where you are. And, um, and so I could, imagine, I could imagine that environment. And, uh, and if you're, I, I could. So those of us who are online often using one of these apps, hours and hours, enjoying the application, what you're saying is somebody else could be using that channel to our device to collect our pictures, to collect my contacts, my telephone numbers, my geo geographic location, where I've been, where, how often I go there. That's the sort of thing you think could be being funneled every time I'm on playing this otherwise unrelated game. Yes. <laughs> okay, I think I'll shut that down.
Question from a student. Question from a student? No? no? All right, back there, yeah. Um, how would somebody living in a country that doesn't have the same Fourth Amendment rights, how would they protect their electronic communication from being monitored? Okay, question is, how about in a, someone living in a country that does not have the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable search and seizure, how could they prevent themselves from their governments keeping track of their information? Um, you can't. You have to opt out of the internet participation or that online digital um, aspect. And um, just this last week, uh, Iran uh, announced that it was going to create its own internet and turn off access to the internet. So think of the global net. They're going to create their own mail system and other things. <laughs> Uh, because they saw Facebook and Yahoo and some of the things that we depend on and use in the West as a threat to um, the Islamic culture and, um, and to their national security, which I would read regime stability. Uh, and they look at it as a potential export uh, industry for other authoritarian governments. Um, so uh, many other countries in Europe and Middle East and many countries around the world uh, do actually uh, intercept and look at the communications of their citizens. And Russia's already got its own internet system and its own language, and China, China. has its own Facebook and so on. Uh, so that would, Iran wouldn't be the first time for that sort of thing. That's right. Um, but let me turn the question on its head and ask you, wouldn't it be possible for the US government, setting aside the political aspect of it for a minute, wouldn't it be possible for the United States government also to s abruptly curtail service access to Facebook or access to Gmail or access to the GPS satellite system or anything of that sort? If, uh, yes, um, uh, it, the art of the possible. Um, technologically, it's Technologically, possible. it's, uh, now, um, it's very difficult uh, to shut, and, and people think that there's an, op you could shut off or down or there's a kill switch to the internet. Let me just, it, that does not exist. But you can in fact block access to parts of the internet and or content and things like that. That's all technically possible. And many countries do that They already. do, yes. Okay. And in the United States we do for um, child pornography and, um, and other types of what we've already categorized as illegal behavior. Uh, we, uh, the internet service providers have a mandate to report it and to not allow it on their infrastructures. Before we say thanks to Melissa Hathaway, let me tell you about our last program of the season coming up three weeks from tonight, not two weeks, three weeks. On Wednesday, May 2nd, we'll meet Matthew Aid. He's a leading historian who first discovered that U.S. intelligence agencies were sneaking back into the National Archives in Washington grabbing unclassified documents and making them secret again after they had already been made public. He's the author or co-author of three books about the most secret kinds of espionage information in the US, especially focusing on the National Security Agency, of course, whose former director, General Michael Hayden, spoke earlier in this series. To be sure you don't miss announcements about programs like this, please get on the list. Clearly print your name and your email address on the bright orange sheets out in the lobby on your way out. We will sell them to whoever pays the <laughs> ISP. That's, that's, a, that's a joke. Uh, now, please, let's thank our speaker tonight, Melissa Hathaway. Good night, everyone. We'll see you again in three weeks.